July 2010 and I'm sat in the Pacific on a boat that we've built out of plastic bottles. The wind's howling and the sea is huge and the plastic he felt like it was about to capsize. And I'm the skipper, responsible for the lives of five boys and I'm thinking to myself, have we gone too far in our quest to stop billions of tons of plastic being dumped into our sea? They've been expecting bad weather, but nothing could prepare the crew for what hits them. Big wave! Big wave! You can barely hold this camera steady. The sea is just monumental. Look at that. Woo! Big wave! <laughs> I'm still here. Uh, we sailed for five months, 11,000 miles from San Francisco to Sydney to test the strength of the Plastiki, the first closed loop designed ocean going sailing vessel. I've been a sailor ever since my dad left me alone in a dinghy, age seven. It was the start of a lifelong love affair with our ever changing <coughs> liquid planet. When I go to sea, I check in with my sense of place in the universe. It reminds me that what really matters is our relationship with nature. And it teaches me that our survival is dependent on the respect we hold in our relationship with nature. My journey to the Plastiki started eight years ago on a beach in the South Atlantic island of South Georgia, looking out towards the Antarctic. It had taken us eight weeks to sail there and I'd wandered off for a moment with myself. It was absolutely beautiful and astonishingly remote. There were hundreds and hundreds of noisy penguins and fair seals. And then, amongst the bleached whale white whale bones and natural tones, bright orange, blues and greens, plastic. I'd gone from a moment of feeling so calm and connected, like the only woman on the planet, to having this tranquility shattered by a human footprint. And it just made me feel so sad. From that moment on, I knew that it was gonna be a change of tack for me. And ever since, I've been exploring the balance between us and nature. And this journey's led me to question how the materials and the products that we use daily impact the health of the sea, our life support system. And it was in the search to the answers of these questions that I joined the Plastiki. We started off learning about plastic and what happens to it when it enters the sea. And I was amazed to learn that plastic is the first man-made material creating ingredients that can't be found in nature. I was surprised to hear that it only really came out of the lab labs and into real life application after the Second World War. And now we've pumped over eight billion tons of plastic into our sea and near enough, every item of plastic that's, been, uh, that's entered the sea is still there today, which makes me think that plastic might just be our geological legacy. Everything rolls downhill and the sea is at the bottom of the hill, so we can see how the ocean acts as our global dustbin. We're all guilty of dropping something now and again. And say we drop something on the street in London, it, the wind could pick it up and off it goes into the Thames, into the English Channel and then out into the, to the Atlantic. Now, due to the constraints of land mass and the impact of current and wind, you get these vast rotating currents known as gyres. There are 11 known gyres. And a little bit like a toilet that never flushes, they attract everything into a central point. Vast accumulations of plastic can be found in the middle of these gyres. Hundreds and thousands of marine mammals get entangled and die totally unnecessarily. Plastic doesn't biodegrade, it photodegrades, and as the sun beats down on it, it breaks down into smaller bits, colourful pieces, mimicking food for sea creatures. They choke on it, sharp bits pierce their tummy lining. Look at this albatross, 
the body decaying back into nature, but the plastic remaining for our forever. And it continues, as, the, as it continues to break down into smaller and smaller pieces, microparticles of plastic act as a sponge, sopping up chemical pollutants from agricultural ind industry runoff, chemicals known to be endocrine disruptors and carcinogenic. These small particles, microparticles of plastic, uh, become orders of magnitude more toxic than the sea around them. The filter feeders at the bottom of the food chain come along and gobble up this plastic along with the plankton, and the toxicity enters the food chain. It accumulates, magnifies, until it ends up back on our plates. So I think we'd all agree that we need to stop dumping billions of tons of plastic into our oceans. And we can do this if we stop thinking of plastic as throwaway and start to consider its true value. After all, like diamonds, plastics are almost forever. We decided that we were going to build a boat that would demonstrate closed loop design, i.e. using sustainably sourced materials or materials that could be reused or upcycled. We wanted to give our boat the biggest test imaginable, so we sailed it across the world's largest ocean. The method and the madness that if we could build a boat that could be upcycled, then everyday products might just follow suit. We started off by collecting 12,000 plastic bottles from waste recycling centres. And these bottles form the boat's buoyancy. They actually also attracted the curiosity of the world's media and we became known as the plastic bottle boat. Now these bottles symbolise the importance to reuse single-use plastic. But this alone isn't going to solve the problem. As we stood around this mountainous pile of bottles, we had yet to find the material that we were going to use to hold these bottles together. And this material had to demonstrate that plastic can be designed to have several applications um, and several uses. Creating a value for plastic that makes industry want it back, like we've done with steel and aluminium. It's important to consider a product's entire life cycle on the planet before we create it first. And if we just look at this toothbrush here, it's got four different types of plastic materials bonded together. They can't be separated to be recycled. So what, we use our toothbrush for three months and it lasts a lifetime on the planet and we see them on beaches washed up all over the world. After searching and searching, we eventually found this SRPT, which we used to build the plastic superstructure from. It's a very clean monomer material, a thermoplastic, changing form at a certain temperature. It's got two weaves running through it, and when heated, one melts and forms the bond, and one stays intact and forms the structural integrity. It maintains many of its high properties through the recycling process, so now we're using this this material to build a boat, and then we can upcycle it to build another boat or even a plane. The material hadn't been used to build anything before, so it didn't come with any manuals, and it took us months and months to get to understand how to build a boat from it, and then to mimic the tons and tons of force that the ocean would eventually put through it. But of course, the biggest test came when we set sail to cross the Pacific. And after fairly limited sail trials and with a fairly green crew, we set sail underneath the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge and pointed to Sydney. We quickly learned that the plastic had a life of her own, and we certainly had many months to get to understand how the material worked. As we sat for days and days motionless in the tropical heat, we saw how the material contracted and relaxed. And as we fell off those almighty waves, we saw it twist, but come back to its original form. You know, the best thing about being involved with the plastic key was that it formed a platform to invite curious minds to explore. And the plastic key wasn't built by one naval architect and one boat builder, but it was the joining of minds of, of um, material scientists, engineers, storytellers, ecologists, and backyard inventors. 
And journeying together, we not only built the first closed loop design sailing boat, but the hurdles that we had to jump through resulted in new inventions, like a honey and cashew nut glue, which is now on the market, and a high performance sail cloth that was built out of old drinks bottles. But what have I learned about plastics? Well, when I stood on that beach in South Georgia, plastic was definitely the villain. And now I've learned to appreciate its material qualities. It's our misunderstanding and our relationship with the material that has caused the problem. And we need to adopt a new one, one where we appreciate its true values. Someone needs to take ownership of this problem. And just like we came together to share knowledge and to build the plastic key, producers of plastic products organizations like L'Oreal, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, should come together with curious minds to turn the tide on throwaway plastics. We would see far less plastic in the sea if every product that hit our shelf came with a closed loop guarantee, an assurance that the material ingredients are as safe as possible, that the product can be disassembled after its application, and that each material in that product has a reuse value. We do need to map out the whole life cycle of a product on the planet before we even build its first. And we should take the lead from nature's design principles, where there's a constant cycle of death and rebirth. I think if we can build a boat with this philosophy in mind, we can build everyday products like a toothbrush. Thank you very much.